Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Everybody, once again, and if you're here with us for the first time today, we'd like to just acknowledge you. If you're here for the first time, would you just lift your hand? Praise God back here. Praise God. Anybody else for the first, first time right here in the front? Praise God. Over here, we'll get to you in just a second. And we appreciate you coming out. If you're a, an, an old timer, you've been here a long time, you're a, you're a veteran of New Harvest, we're glad that you decided to come to church because you have to make that decision, uh, like Manny said, you've got to make it a habit to come to church. So we're glad that you came out and are participating. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to jump right into the Word of God. Open your Bibles up into the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 43, please. If you use the Version Bible app, uh, if you go and you open it up and you go to home and then hit more and then hit events and you have your uh, GPS turned on, you'll find that we have our sermon, a sermon today is on there. You can tap it and get some information about what we're doing as well as being able to uh, write some notes if you want to do that. Uh, But for the rest of us, we're just going to go ahead and look at Isaiah. Praise God. And I want to talk to you today about having a fresh start. Having a fresh start. Praise God. Isaiah 43 and verse 14 will be our starting point. You know, sometimes we need a fresh start. If you're not a Christian, one of the things that often attracts you to the church is like, well, maybe there's some help for me, for my situation. When things are going well, people don't usually think about God or or care about God. They just continue on with their life. That's why most of us came to Christ when we were kind of at the end of our rope, you know. We were having problems in our home, our family, maybe in our hearts or, you know, just lives were just maybe not going the way that we thought. We said, man, I need something. I need a fresh start. But, you know, as Christians and being born again, uh, every real Christian here (laughs) knows that there are times when you just feel like, man, I need a do-over. You know, I really just need to start again, and uh, if we're really honest and open, and you should be, you're in church, don't lie, (laughs) is that you uh, need a fresh start more often than you care to admit. We need to kind of regroup and regather and and, and get our self aligned again with God and His Word, and that's why I like to turn to this passage It's not the only passage we can talk about, but this is a good one, and it really gives us some understanding here. So let's read uh, Isaiah 43, and as we read, I just want to tell you, just in case some of you are like addicted to the PowerPoint presentation, this is the only slide for today. So some of you might be like, why aren't they changing the slide? Change the slide. This is it. This is all she wrote, as my dad used to say. So (laughs) Isaiah 43, 14 says this, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, in the ships in which they rejoice. They love their ships. I am the Lord, uh, sorry about that, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. 
Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, behold, check it out, open your eyes. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let's stop right there. Heavenly Father, we pray today together as your people, asking for your understanding, your wisdom, guidance and direction that you bring to us. I pray, Lord, that I would decrease and you would increase. You would speak the lives here today, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Fresh start, something that we need. As we read this passage here, uh, the God is laying out some of his titles, some of his names. And you can tell a lot by someone's title and who they are. If someone comes in and says, hey, I'm a constable, your attitude changes right away. You know, if someone comes in and says, I'm a judge, I'm a magistrate, you know, you have a different attitude towards that person. If someone says, I'm a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you start, some of you start getting scared and nervous, you know. (laughs) Uh, Oftentimes, when I introduce myself, I don't like to say I'm the pastor because some people just have this authority thing and they get scared and nervous. Some couldn't care less about the authority. But I often just want to say my own name because that title has some issues in people's minds. When the Lord is laying out his titles here, they're giving us some understanding. He says, first of all, that he's the creator of Israel. He can create things. He can create things in your life. He can create opportunities for you. You may look at your life and say, man, there's no jobs. Man, I, I, I've passed my life. I can't get an education. It's too late. Man, my marriage is just blockaded on all sides, and we've come this far. I've just given up hope. I want to tell you, God is able to create things because he's not only the creator of Israel, the Old Testament God's people, but he's also the creator of Christians. He can work in your life and create new things. That's wonderful truth that you should grab on today. Some of you could just probably stop right there. Lord, create in me what I need. We also see that he calls himself, I am the Lord, your Redeemer. The word Redeemer means one who recovers ownership by paying a price. Isn't this what Jesus did for us on the cross? Is that he paid the price for your sins and mine. He is willing to redeem us and buy us back. He'll redeem you from your silly mistakes. He'll redeem you from your past Way back and recent. We often, as preachers, like to talk about way in the past, you know, but sometimes it's people's recent past that they need deliverance from. (laughs) And he can redeem that because that's the God whom we serve. He also describes himself, and I kind of like this the most. He says, I am your king. He is our ruler. He is the benevolent government that rules over us and cares about us. If you have an evil, wicked king, we hate the the authority of the king. But if you have a benevolent king, a good king, a loving king, a king that can provide, a king that can orchestrate, a king that cares, then that's a wonderful truth today. God is our redeemer, our creator, our king And tonight, or this morning rather, if you're struggling in your life, if you need a fresh start in your home, in your marriage, in your family, God is able to give you a fresh start. I promise you today by the Word of God. Now, he does this fresh start here in the book of Isaiah by reminding them of their past victories. And sometimes that's good good theology for us to sit down and just remember what God has done for us. Remember the things that he's brought us out of. Sometimes God does these great things, but then when we get into the midst of a mess and we sit there and we're looking at our lives and saying, what am I going? We we forget all about these great things. We act as if God was powerful back then, but now he's just, eh. He's just kind of a so-so God. I'm here to tell you that's a satanic attitude. God wants to do great things, and we need to sometimes remember the things uh, that happens in the past because we can often get kind of wallowy in our wallowing 
in our staleness where we kind of get like, ah, it's the way things are, and we just kind of do things with the humdrum, the, 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 the attitude that's mediocre, just kind of, just that feeling of staleness and stagnation. But reflecting back can sometimes inspire us and let us know that something good is up ahead. I'm here to tell you today, we have to remember things. The prophet is telling them, for the Lord, to remember the Red Sea. Remember, Israelites, what went on in the Red Sea. And most of us that are Christians know the miracle of the Red Sea. Sometimes we just know it, you know, in our minds academically, but it's not a reality in our lives in the present form. But the Bible says that he split the Red Sea, and one translation says that he made a road for the Israelites. And boy, I grab on to that today, because if you're stale, God wants to make a road for your life. He wants to help you with your life. He wants to give you a, 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 a he wants you to understand the journey, the journey, because that's what you're on. And journeys that are just easy going all the time, they're not very fun. They're kind of boring. You know, I was born in Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles, we have a freeway system, a motorway system that is used to travel. You can't go anywhere of any significance without getting on a motorway there. But they also have these massive highways. They're called interstates, and the federal government many, many years ago decided they were going to build this interstate highway system, and they built one that goes from Los Angeles all the way up to the Canadian border, hundreds of miles. It actually takes more than a day to travel from the bottom to the top. And then there's ones that go from California all the way to the East Coast. You know, if you know anything about the geography of the U.S., it can go all the way to like Florida on one highway. And the problem with those highways is that they're great for traveling, but they are ultra, ultra boring. They are so, you just, you're like, it's mind-numbing. It's like you're just, it's kind of like a plane ride, you know? When you first get on your plane, you're, I'm going on holiday. And then after 45 minutes, you know, hour, two, three, let me out of this tube, man. (laughs) And we have, uh, when it's boring like that, it's not fun. When there's things happening, when there's joys and when there's fear, when there's awe, when there's wonder, when there's adventure, when things go bad, that means that something's going to go good after. If something's going bad, that means you had a good time because you recognize this is now bad, that was good, that's a good thing, that's the journey. And I have a, it's a picture frame in my office that is not up on the wall yet, but it says, embrace your journey. I want to tell you today, God will make a road for you in your wilderness, a journey for you to travel on, a journey as a parent, as a couple, as an individual. Embrace that journey and look for the fresh start. He also says that he makes this statement where he talks about the chariots and the horses and how he extinguishes them. You know what he did in the Red Sea? He made a road for the Israelites but made a grave for their enemies. You may say, man, I have enemies piled to the sky. Hopefully they're not sitting next to you this morning. But if you have enemies, God will make a way to crush those enemies. Not because he's cruel, but because he loves you that much. Because he cares about you that much. You are that important to him. And so don't worry about the problems in your life. God will make a road for you and a grave for your enemy. But here's the deal. I think God gives us fresh starts for a purpose. I don't think he just says, okay, do over. Yeah, go ahead, start again. I think he has a plan for us. I think there's things that he wants to do in your life, plans that he desires you to fulfill and to carry out. And I think sometimes the reason that we have so many stops and starts and, you know, we we go and then we don't, slips and slides, minor backslidings, sometimes major backslidings, is because we're just wanting to get out of our problem. That's all we're looking at. Just get me out of this problem. Not, Lord, I'm in this problem. What's your purpose? 
what's your plan for me right now? I think he does have a plan for us, and I think it's easy to at least get started on this. And it's found in the book of Ephesians. You can turn there, the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And if you have um, an, an electronic Bible, you can turn to the New Living Translation. If you don't, whatever Bible version you have will be similar, but the one I'm reading from today is the New Living Translation. Verse 24, and then keep your finger there. We'll hit it uh, in just a minute. It says, put on your new nature. Hmm. Let that sink in for just a minute. Put on your new nature. So that must mean that if we're Christians, we have a new nature. We possess it. But it tells us that we must put it on. We can't just assume it's there. It needs to be put on. Every time I come to church, I put on what I call church clothes because I dress for church. And if I just dressed in my comfy clothes, you might be shocked. (laughs) The reality is you've got to put on the new nature that you've been given. Just because you're acting like your old self doesn't mean that God hasn't given you a new nature. You can have a lot of nice clothes, but if you just keep them in your wardrobe and never put them on, no one will know that you possess it. And that's why we have to take God's new nature that we have in Christ Jesus and put it on, and I'll even say this, daily. You have to put it on daily. He says, put on your new nature, which is created to be like God. He wants you to be like God. Not be God, don't confuse the two, but God-like characteristics and qualities. My son looks like me, kind of acts like me a little bit, but it, he never going to be me because I'm not going to let him. And you fathers know what I'm talking about. You, yeah, you, okay, you, yeah, I want you to grow up, son, but I'm still dad. I might be 100 years old, but I'll still give you a beat down. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. Others are going, amen, that's right. Same thing with God. We want God-like characteristics that come from the new nature, but we'll never be God nor should we try to be. We should try to put on his nature. What this is to me when I read this is that God wants us looking fresh. You know, we have a saying in the ghetto, (laughs) look, yo, you looking fresh. I want you to turn to your name and go, yo, you looking fresh right now. All right, yeah, you looking fresh. You should look fresh. (laughs) We used to have this saying when I was a new convert, man, you're young, fresh, and saved. Well, I'm not young anymore, but I'm fresh and saved. (laughs) But I want to tell you that um, it shouldn't just be you that is fresh. Your marriage should be fresh. And I don't want to spend a lot of time, because I know we have mixed company here, but I think most of you that are not married would, might want to get married. You, you're looking to get married at some day. So I was reading this article that, uh, for ladies to read. See, that's what you do, guys. Let me tell you, you read the ladies' articles, so then you know, like, what's going on in their head. You know, you read the one about men, they just tell you, yeah, you know, trim your mustache, make sure your clothes look sharp. And, now, you've got to read what they read. So this is an article that says, if your husband does these 13 things, you hit the marriage jackpot. (laughs) So we're going to test you guys here today. See if you hit the jackpot. And ladies that are not married, this is what you're looking for. If you don't have these things, think twice, sis. Think twice. Number one, your husband encourages and inspires you. I already <laughs> See, I got, I've got to confess this. I already ran these by Gracie to make sure I'm cool, you know. 
because I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Number two, your husband can comfort and calm you. You should be able to comfort and calm you. If you can't comfort and calm your wife, you know, men say, ah, oh, submit, yeah, you know. How about can you comfort and calm her? Gracie, she's a wild beast when she's on her own, man. <laughs> Not like a beast, you know, but like wild and strong, strong-willed. Some people in, their, in, in our time, you know, they look like, dude, man, how do you deal with her, you know? And it's like, I don't know I like her like that, you know? I, I never wanted this little, <laughs> you know, I want, yeah, it knows what's up. But I always told her, I said, you know, you got me because I'm the one that can contain you and corral you. But that involves comforting and calming as well. Number three, he still flirts with you. (laughs) That part, I'm a pro. Number four, your partner works hard. Number five, your husband loves spending time with you. Number six is an unusual one. He loves and respects his mother. Look at how he treats his mom before you marry that guy. If he treats her bad, his sisters, be careful. Be careful. He compliments you often, number seven. Number eight. Now it's getting quiet now, huh? (laughs) It's like, ooh, this was fun. No, it's not so fun. Number eight, your husband is selfless. That's a hard one. Selfless, But isn't that what the Bible says, that we're to uh, love our wives as Christ loved the church, giving his life for the church. We're to give our lives for our wives. Some men act as if their wives are supposed to give their life for us. (laughs) Number nine, your husband says, I love you often. (laughs) Number ten, you are his number one priority. Number eleven... He surprises you. You know, if, you, if, if you're predictable, man, I want to tell you, you're in trouble. And the longer you've been married, the more you're going to have to think of new things because she already got your number, bro. She already knows what you're all about. She's already, you know, you, you, you can't recycle like three surprises, you know. Like, I've got, th- I bring flowers, chocolates, and a dinner date, okay. And she already knows, okay, we had the flowers and chocolate. The next one's the dinner date. <laughs> oh man, I have all kinds of bad thoughts going through my mind right now. Number 12, you are a team. Hmm. And number 13, here, ladies, you hit the jackpot if he admits when he is wrong. Sometimes you. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. So, keep your marriage fresh, can you say amen? amen? But the Bible also says in this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 that the person who is fresh, the one who has the new start, the one whom God is empowering to have a new go at life, is someone that should also have a new tongue. A new tongue. I had a side job, I've said it before, you know, a side job delivering medical billing records to Beverly Hills doctors, very high-end doctors that saw lots of movie stars, and uh, I had this, it was a great job, actually, uh, just uh, access to go in, just walk into the uh, doctor's offices, and I had my little spot where I would give the files and pick up the new files, and there's lots of people in there, and sometimes you'd run into movie stars, and one time there was Gene Simmons was in there. He was the lead singer for the rock band Kiss. Some of you will remember, he was the guy that had a tongue about this long. He literally needed a new tongue. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. I, I, when I saw him, I wanted to go, <laughs> but I said, I better keep my job, so... The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, so stop telling lies. (laughs) Let us tell our neighbors the truth. And here's, here's the kicker right here. For we are all parts of the same body. So he's not saying, hey, you sinners, 
You stop lying. He's saying, you Christians, stop your lying. Christians lie. I know some of you are like, oh. I've been pastoring long enough, but I know people lie. Even if you ask them a point blank question, they'll lie. We should watch that because lying just begins to infect us and others because now people are operating not with a even playing field. Now they're operating with this attitude of deceit and falsehood that they might proceed thinking that this is true. I remember when I met Gracie, you know, we were, uh, I was a young guy at that time, and she just like had her act together compared to me. And I said, man, I cannot blow this. I cannot blow this. I like this girl. I want her. I, I want to be with her. I can't. And I knew, I said, look it, I can't like g- give her a line, you know. I can't just tell her things to keep her on the line. I can't just say things that make me look good because if she finds me out, she's going to dump me like a hot rock, man, you know. And I remember I had to always tell the truth and I was just... I just started being myself, and it was so liberating, to be honest, with flaws and everything. And we should never tell lies, because we have to have a new tongue if we're going to be a new man or a new woman in Christ. If you're going to put on that new nature, that involves new kinds of speech patterns. Our text here that we're looking at now in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 says this, don't use foul or abusive language. Again, you think, man, Christians don't cuss, don't swear. Christians never say anything harsh. Oh, (laughs) oh, (laughs) they're the best. They're the best. You know why? Because we know how to use good words as well. We can be sweet as pie because we've learned that grace from God, right? But then when you want to cut, it's like a knife. Pretty good sound effects there, actually. (laughs) Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. You want a fresh start? Start talking different. You want a fresh marriage? Uh, uh, Look for more than just chocolates and flowers. Look for new kind of ways of talking, things that you can be helpful and be good. Those are words that are helpful or words that bring encouragement, the Bible says, rather. It says that should what we, is what we should be, the most encouraging people in the world. And that's, that takes a lot of skill because it's not saying that we should be people that just encourage everybody with, with, with fluffy kind of words like, hey, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be fine. Sometimes it's not going to be okay. You're going to have to change your attitude. Sometimes we have to tell people the truth. But when we tell them the truth, we should be able to surround that with words that edify and build up. If you have to tell your husband to knock it off and to do something different, that's fine. But also build him up. He's a man with an ego. If you strip him of his ego, you stripped him of his manhood. Don't do that. So we have to not just find encouraging words, only exclusively. They have to be encouraging words instead of foul and hurting words. You got it? This is how we get the new start. Then we're going to need not only a new tongue, but a new temper. Hmm. Verse 26, Ephesians 4, 26, and don't sin by letting anger control you. See, that's the thing about anger, is it lies to us. Anger tells us, if you just let me out, you'll feel better. If I can just get rid of my anger and expel it, then I'll be cleansed. It's a lie. Once you let anger out, it's like a crazy Tasmanian devil that just surrounds your life, and now before you know it, it controls the situation. Whenever anger is in charge, no productivity ever takes place. Never. And that's why it says, don't let anger, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. We are going to get angry, 
but we don't want to let it control us. That means it's for a reasonable time period. And while you're feeling the anger, don't do anything foolish and don't let it go on for an extended period. You have control in that because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. That means that God gives us that control that we need to be able to deal with things like this. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. So many marriages are destroyed because of the foothold of anger. (laughs) You know, and I've said this jokingly and kind of to make myself look good sometimes, I said, you know, when I was young, I was such a kind guy. Grace said he was such a kind man, you know. And that, you know, she says this seriously, like at first she thought I was an angel because I was so kind. But the problem was this, is that all the people that I was around, all my friends and all the people who I admired in those days before Christ, they weren't kind. They were angry men. They were violent men. They were men that uh, prided themselves on being able to be that tough guy. I didn't care much about that. I always says, man, I'm a lover, not a fighter. (laughs) But the truth was is that angry spirit infected me. And before you know it, the kind angel that Gracie married, not quite so kind. And the truth is, is that that what's in me could spread to her. And then before you know it's in her, now it's in the kids. Now it's in, it's just a chain reaction. That's why most of you probably know this in the neighborhood you grew up in. There are families that are known for violence. There are families for known. They're all angry. They're all upset all the time because anger has this controlling thing and that's why if we're going to have a new start, a fresh start, we're going to have to deal with this and the Bible tells us to make sure we deal with it because once we allow it to have a foothold, now the devil just begins to wreak havoc in our lives. just want to throw one more uh, thought at you today concerning this issue of anger and a foothold is that anger... Once it gets into our hearts and starts controlling us, uh, it starts to equate into unbelief. Because we we, we originally get angry because we want to see something happen. We want to see a change in that person or a situation or we feel like if we spout off that people will hear and then we can get some change. But then it doesn't happen because anger never changes anything. It's if it does, it's momentary. And so then what happens after it doesn't change anything, we start looking, because we're Christians here, we're sitting here going, well, God, where is God? God can help me here. And God doesn't move because the devil has a foothold. And now we start going, man, God's not with me. I don't even believe God anymore. And so anger goes to unbelief so quickly. Are you with me? See, if we're going to have a fresh start, we're going to have to use that new inner strength that Jesus gives us. Because he does strengthen the inner man. He does strengthen the inner individual. And we have to begin to work at that. A new temper also equates into a new way of living. Look at verse 28, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. We're winding down for those of you who have a roast on. For those of you that can afford a roast... For those of you that are going to McDonald's, don't worry. They'll have plenty. Don't go to KFC because they're out of chicken again. (laughs) Shocking, man. Went to a coffee shop yesterday to get a coffee for the road on travel. And they said, sorry, but we're out of coffee. I said, are you? No, I thought I heard wrong. And I said, every bit of coffee? There's like no coffee in the whole. No, I'm sorry, we have no coffee. And I'm thinking, well, why are you open, you know? And the anger was rising up. (laughs) And I said, well, that's pretty bad for a coffee shop not to have coffee. And they looked at me incredulous like I'm an idiot. (laughs) I'm thinking, who's the idiot here? (sighs) Verse 28, Ephesians 4, 28 says, If you are a thief... Quit stealing. Now, again, we're talking about Christians here. If you're a thief, quit stealing. 
One thing I like is that it's implying that there's thieves sitting among us today. That's what it's saying, isn't it? I mean, it's right. It's not saying, hey, if you're a thief, quit stealing so you can get saved. It doesn't say anything like that. It says, instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Well, that's not a non-Christian point of view. That's a Christian point of view. He's speaking to Christians here. And you may think, well, how could there thieves be in church? I'll tell you the thieves in church. We had a, a, a toilet paper theft here in our church, and I'm still bitter and angry over it. You know, I, I, I think of all the things that one could steal. You have to steal toilet paper. It's incredible, but it doesn't stop there. I can remember when I was a missionary in the 90s and going back to my home church, uh, and I had uh, one of the few nice things I owned was a very nice 35 millimeter camera. Sister Gracie sitting in the front row listening to me preach wonderfully and powerfully and anointed and uh, that's a joke but uh, all of that then when we're done uh, someone stole the camera from the front row of the church in my home church and I'm still angry about it it's a foothold in me stop stealing but I wonder what else we steal do we steal people's dreams do we steal the promises? They're believing God for something. You come along with your sarcastic, hard-nosed attitude and steal someone's hope? <laughs> Do you steal their future by not setting the example for the next generation? By having your attitude of, well, I've been saved, you know, 100 years. And... <laughs> Is that what you do? Quit stealing. Quit being a thief. Get a job. Get a job. Use your hands for good hard work. Stop stealing dreams and hope from people. Start working to build hope in people. Build dreams in people. Facilitate their dreams. Find a way to do that. Give generously of yourself. See, Christians that have been saved quite some time, what they do is they feel like, I've already gave. They don't say it verbally, and they may not even mentally think it, but it's almost like subconsciously they're living out that life that says, now is the time for me to reap. And I, I won't deny that as you get older, you should be getting some benefits from being a Christian. It's a good thing being saved, no question about that. But if that becomes your sole driving force in life, man, please... If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and give generously to others in need. I want to close today with Jesus gives fresh starts. There's no question about that. Our God that we read about through the pen of the prophet Isaiah promised the children of Israel new things, said, I'm going to do it. Do you not perceive it? He reminded them of their past victories. Jesus does the same thing through his word. If you read this entire chapter of Ephesians, you'll read about all the new things that Christ gives and the new life we have in Christ. The Bible says, put on that fresh start. Some of you, God has already given you a fresh start. You're just not wearing it. It's hidden away in your wardrobe somewhere. God says, put it on. Let it be today. Your circumstances may still be poor. may not be what you want. You may not be desirous of what you have at the moment, but put on the new man, the new woman, the new person in Christ now. Because if you do it, now you're starting that fresh start with the new tongue. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to use harsh language. I'm going to use encouraging words. Even if I've got to tell somebody some negative truth, I'm going to do my best to surround that, place it on a bed of encouragement with my words, my new tongue, my new temper. I'm not allowing anger to get control over my life. I'm going to come today to this altar. I'm going to repent of that. I'm going to say no to my anger. It has a foothold. It might just be a foothold. Sometimes we think of angry people as violently angry people. People who have faces that look like mine, you know. 
But honestly, anger could come in subtle forms, seething underneath a smile that can be there, and it'd be a foothold, and you need to repent of that. And we discuss being a thief here. Let's grab on to the fresh start. Praise God. Let's bow our heads as we go before the Lord today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, you're a blesser, and we thank you for that. You're an awesome God, a good God. Thank you for providing for us. Meet needs here today. Save souls. Rekindle the flame in a backslider's heart. Touch my brothers and sisters in Christ so they can experience a fresh start. Let us put on the new man. Thank you, Lord. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M3 6BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.